model and multidimensional interviewing is that Carl Rogers doesn't really have any specific intention to change the client, but rather Carl Rogers would just follow where the clients would want to go and support the client all the way until hopefully a change is going to happen. With motivational interviewing, although probably about 80% of that will be coming from Carl Rogers' uh, system, but the 10 or 20% is really there's an end goal in mind. There is a plan on the part of the uh, therapist where the client is going to end up. Say, for example, to stop smoking, to stop using alcohol, or to stop using illicit drugs, or even comply with their dietary restrictions when they are diabetic, or to take their medications when they are hypertensive. Now, so basically, target is behavioral change. That's why it's applicability across all such specialties. So, needless to say that it's very important for us to understand muna yung change, no? So, but before we start, just a short question. Uh, what does motivational interviewing mean to you? If ever you came across that particular answer the first question and there are no wrong answers by the way we will not withhold your snacks uh, <laughs> so don't worry everybody will be coming out uh, satisfied <laughs> after this what comes to mind when about motivational interviewing i feel come from not really yet but perhaps your way of of your idea of of understanding some background on it, like <laughs> any any ideas? Okay, so change. Ano pa? Change. Okay. Although it's not motivational, it's a lot of things. Any other thoughts or ideas? Yes, okay. So, motivational interviewing is, is, is kind of, I mean, some to translate, but it's a way of communicating with clients. It's very much centered on what's going on between clients and is very conscious of the dynamics of what is being said how it is being said, what is the tone that it is being said. That's where motivational interviewing is trying to exert its influence by the client. A way of being with client, and being means how to converse with the client. And of course, the center of the conversation is not the therapist as the expert, but really the client becomes the expert. And the therapist is a mere facilitator of the conversation process. That makes it depend on um, our therapeutic techniques that we know of, interpersonal therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll make it painless. I will not go through all the, <laughs> the questions. Because I, I thought that this is a one-hour lecture, and I was told that it's one hour, so I have to, to kind of cut some of the slides. So, Motivational interviewing is a client-centered style. So similar to Roger's concept, it's the client who is the center of that particular process. Um, aim at helping people explore and resolve their ambivalence. Ambivalence is central to behavior change. The notion of, of uh, Bill Miller and uh, Rolnick, these are the authors of motivational interviewing, and they're still alive up to now, um, we get to see them every now and then and talk to them, is that change only happens when a person actually is able to resolve the ambivalence. Can you remember the last time that you want to change something, be it like myself, I'll start exercising some more, but it's been two years. <laughs> so I would always start exercising for a few weeks and then stop again for whatever reason and then go back again and see the ambivalence. Perhaps for some people, it can just be 
Well, seriously, it can be, do I have to break up with my partner or not? No? So every change that is being envisioned actually would lead to ambivalence. And the ambivalence is always whether to go with a change process or not. And therefore, motivational interviewing targets that ambivalence, helps the client break the ambivalence so that the client himself will be able or herself will be able to decide where to go and when to go. Okay? So I'm emphasizing it's a very interactive process and when you do motivational interviewing, you are very conscious of what's going on, what is being said, what is not being said, and of course what you are saying as the uh, interventionist. Forgive my term for not using uh, therapy or counseling because basically MI is not counseling. It's not even a therapy. Um, okay, so people who engage in harmful drug or alcohol use. So I, again, um, most of the references that we will be talking about refers to drug abuse. Kasi doon siya nang galing. Eh, no? um, people who engage in harmful behaviors often they say they want to stop using but they simply don't know how are unable to or are not fully ready to stop and that leads us to understanding two different change models the first one is the traditional approach you know uh, the old approach that that we use uh, in the past and of course the second one refers to motivational interviewing Okay, um, over the years, the views of change and how we view people changing has actually changed, now, especially in many areas of healthcare. Like I said, uh, we're not looking now at behavioral change model in just the substance abuse part, but really uh, sex workers use condoms. EMI is applied to that as well. Uh, helping uh, young people practice safe sex. MI has been used to that, has been used in those particular contexts. So, coming up with it. So, even using it in my adolescent children, sometimes, because it's, it's the chief of the TRC in our area as well. So, she knows. And so, uh, well, I, I taught her too, but when I apply it to her, she easily kind of, oh, I'm sorry. She easily recognized, are you doing in my own again? <laughs> so, So, uh, <laughs> it doesn't want the, the, the so the, the, the traditional way is really looking at uh, parang sinasabi natin if you have a heart attack that should teach you a lesson and not eat fatty foods anymore or perhaps do something with your diet and perhaps probably be more religious with your medications right uh, Sometimes the people, especially nowadays, where a lot of people are being imprisoned because of possession of illegal drugs, uh, one would say that perhaps after experiencing the painful uh, environment of a prison will make them realize that they should not stop, or they should stop dealing with drugs or taking drugs. Or perhaps even those who have experienced relationship problems with chronic use of alcohol, memory blackouts, and even vehicular accidents, for example, because of driving while intoxicated, is enough to make people change. It's not always the case. So one begins to wonder, what makes people change? Right? So it's not those painful things that they experience, although for some, that can be a reali realization, but not all of them would actually change, despite 
uh, experiencing negative uh, things related to what they're doing. No? It can seem surprising that people don't simply stop using drugs, considering that um, drug addiction creates too many problems. No? Lahat ng arian, lahat ng seedings, especially with my gambling patients, naubos na lahat ng pera, and still they can't stop. Alam na, ni, alam na yung consequences, alam nila kung ano yung, yung impact on themselves and their family, and yet they can't stop. No? And yet, the behavior still persists. No? So, the old way really of making people change traditionally is that if you can make them feel bad enough or make them feel guilty, make that good trigger some change, then I'm not saying it, it doesn't. To a certain degree, guilt can be a good external motivator. Fear can be a good external motivator. Fear is external. And it's always time limited. Pag nawala yung guilt, wala na rin motivation to change. Diba? So, people don't change if they haven't suffered enough. So, six years in prison is not enough. Maybe let's make it 12. Parang ganun. <laughs> or, or they haven't really reached the lowest moment in their life and that's the reason they can change. So these are the more traditional way of looking at how people change. And that's why if some of you have been exposed to treatment rehabilitation center, may meron ba? Considering that the TRC treatment Malagos is a graduate of uh, <laughs> If, if you're familiar with the therapeutic community environment in a rehabilitation center, it's very confrontative, very strict. No? Uh, that's where it was coming from. The traditional way of, of making people change. Although, don't get me wrong, uh, the TC model is still effective in terms of other aspects, but not on the motivational aspects. So that's why I re retain pa rin yung therapeutic community na concepts to sa rehabilitation centers natin. Okay? Baka mamaya magkaroon tayo, hindi pala effective yung, yung PC. It is. It, it, one, of the, one of the reasons it's effective is because it's structure. It creates structure. It, it imposes structure on the individuals. In which, alam naman natin, pag medyo drug dependent ka, wala kang structure. You eat anytime, you sleep anytime, you're not in sync with everyone. Tayo naman na normally existing, meron tayong time frame. You wake up at 6, take a bath, eat breakfast, go to the hospital, do our duties, make the rounds, go home at 5, cook dinner. So meron tayong routine, may structure tayo. Drug dependent persons generally don't have. So it's that structure that TC actually teaches in the therapeutic community setting, in the rehabilitation programs. So our approaches are typically based on our beliefs and views about individuals with alcoholism. So that's why the old way is really more punitive. Dahil nga, dapat he has to experience a lot of difficulties bago siya mag-change, di ba? So sometimes some of the old ways of dealing with rehabilitation, rehabilitating clients is really making it difficult for them. Okay? Traumatizing them. Well, um, if trauma and stress has its benefits as well. Work lang sana over. But the problem is, like for example, if, if I'm giving you a deadline to submit something on motivational interviewing by tomorrow afternoon, I'm sure you will be stressed. But you will be motivated to produce. Otherwise, I'm going to tell Dr. Gonzalez that you will not move from first year to second year. Right? That's motivation. Kaya lang, to each one of us, hindi uniform yung goals. That can lead to a breakdown for you, for example, because that probably is too much. But for somebody else, it gives them more productivity. So that's why stress can be a good motivator. It increases uh, actually productivity. The problem is 
you don't know kung yung dose of stress is good for this individual or it's more hazardous to this particular individual. So kaya ni stress kayo sa training program. Minsan, palagi. Oh. <laughs> Ginamit ka ganyan. <laughs> of course, for all to that are the beliefs that why people don't change. And ito yung common natin na belief, di ba? That, that drug dependent persons actually don't want to go into rehab or treatment because they are in a denial states, right? No? Uh, people that they do not acknowledge that they have a problem. And given that particular mindset, yung target mo to treat them is to make them to make them admit that they have a problem. Hirap, ano? And to think that around 80% of our drug using population doesn't really admit they have a problem. And if ever they admit, merong tawag natin dyan, discounting. No? Pag tinanong mo ilang boteng beer, hindi mo araw-araw. So sabihin, 15. When actually the real count is 30. So merong discount. So dapat sa senior citizen, 50% siya agad. So yun. So and typically we have been taught to deal with denial by breaking it. That's why TC is very confrontative. If you have attended a TC session, meron silang pinapaupo yung uh, individual concern surrounded by other drug using or more much older or senior na mga na mga uh, drug users that are being rehabilitated and they confront the individual about the behaviors. So yeah. So for Confronting sensitivity means that you must admit that you are an alcoholic or a drug addict. You better do this or else you will end up in jail. So therefore, the emphasis is really if drug-dependent persons or drug-using persons are in denial, therapy should be how to break that denial. Parang, how do we translate that in psychiatry? For insight, diba? So how do you how do you deal with poor insight in the psychiatric setting? Psychoeducation, diba? What else? Insight oriented psychotherapy, which will last you last probably about one to three years. <laughs> Ayun, so so again, we natin nakikita yung belief system dictates kung ano yung approach. So so sige. <laughs> Is there something weird going on like this? <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Because when I was here, when before this thing burned down, there are also things that are going on. I probably got it. Maritain yung ano. Oh. Hindi siya umalis. Parang yung sa bahay sa old, old house namin. Hindi nga, parang hindi nga namin masabi ng visitors, parang kami yung visitors, kami yung visitors sa bahay. O namamahay, they would walk in the middle of the night, you can hear them walking on the floor, kasi wood yung floor ng bahay namin, the old house. When you kind of get used to it, you just, hi, how are you there, just keep going on. Okay, so then resistance is created because of the denial, diba? So it's a very tough situation to be in, you know? Parang you end up actually quarreling with the patient, right? Which is not again therapeutic, no? Lumalabas yung, ano bang definition ng therapeutic alliance, diba? So ano bang therapeutic alliance yan when one is denying and you are insisting? What kind of alliance would that be, di ba? Walang talaga pupuntahan niya. So, so therefore, resistance by the client is often typically met with, well, psychoeducation is a better term, but most of the time it's an argument between the doctor or the clinician and the client, right? Matawa ka. Tama, di ba? Tapos yung 
authoritative stance pa natin. Yung, we call that MMI, the writing reflex. Kasi because we studied college for four years, we took up medicine, another four years, PGI, passed the board exam with flying colors, therefore I am much better than you. You are the patient, I am the doctor, I know better. Therefore, you should follow what I say. Diba? Ganon? That's something that MI wants to disaggregate and discourage us from... Uh, that's why sometimes we call it, be aware of the writing reflex. The writing reflex is not the one that you see in physiology, where you throw the cut up, and then pag landing ng cut, four-legged pa rin, ano? <laughs> not that one. Writing reflex is really our tendency to correct something when we see that there is something wrong. It's an automatic response. Maybe because of our education system. Halos naman lahat eh. When I was in the US, writing reflex then. When you talk in, with the Indonesians, meron yung writing reflex. But with us healthcare professionals that are highly educated, napaka-strong ng writing reflex natin. We cannot tolerate errors. <laughs> We always want to like, mm, mm, mm. right, di ba? Uh, of course, pag excessive naman, oh, posible na yan. Okay. So, yeah. So, I'll skip that. Okay. So, another thing is, in the old way, we, we, we try to look at patients in terms of labels. Dapat meron talagang diagnosis yan, meron ka talagang itatawag dyan, ano? And it's, it's like difficult for us clinicians not able to label something, right? Especially when your consultant is asking, okay, okay, so what do you call that? <laughs> <laughs> right? And then I, we do away with labels, okay? So like old labels, they say, this person is very manipulative. And therefore, to combat that, you insist you are being an expert. They're combative and therefore you have to confront them. They're angry then you have to put them in uh, several anger management sessions and a lot of other sessions. Resist that, counsel. Not counseling in a time sense but really giving advice. So, unmotivated, direct them, denial, ang dami, di ba? So these are these are the labels that we commonly use to describe our patients. Even a resident sometimes when when they you know, when you have an admission, you refer to the consultant. Ang daming labels. Just tingnan mo yung ano yung sinasabi niya sa mga consultant. Resistant. <laughs> ano ba yung mga tinatawag natin? Poor insight. In denial. Di ba? Ginagamit rin natin yan, di ba? Ayun. So we have to be aware of that. If you want to look at uh, motivational interviewing as one thing that you want to practice. Uh, and one bright person named Kevin Eikenberry, I don't know him personally, but he said that people are not resistant to change. They resist being changed. And that's the difference. The old way is that we are the ones changing them. And therefore, we can understand why we are resisting. The motivational way of doing it is really the client itself is an advocate for change. Ayon, but that, no? Easy to say, hard to do. No? So when we talk about change, change is a concept. No? Uh, Prochaska and De Clemente, they're still alive today again. Uh, <laughs> Uh, talk about the stages of change. Ang sinasabi nila is that if a person wants to change something, he has to go through the different stages of change. Why is it important for us to understand that? It's important kasi bawat stage of change, there's a different mindset. There's a different intervention that can be done. Okay? So, uh, in relation to motivational interviewing, kasabihin nyo, this is another concept. Stages of change and MI. Actually, they, they, they're married to each other. Stages of change is like kind of a diagnostic tool 
where you can say that my client is currently at this stage of change. So when you identify what stage of change your client is, you can now do an MI that is correlated with that particular stage of change. Okay, let's understand a little bit more. Okay, uh, the stages of change are about recognizing and understanding that change doesn't happen all at once. Tama nga naman. But some of us forget. Kala natin pag sinabing, you should stop smoking by tomorrow, parang akala natin it's just easy. Well, it took me three years to stop my smoking. It wasn't easy. <laughs> That's an example. So, what makes it not easy because is that change actually happens to stages. It's not something like you decide now and let it be tomorrow. There are stages that, that are being followed. It usually takes time and patience. And uh, the stages of change acknowledges that people go through the series of stages as they begin to recognize that they have a problem. And kasama to the stages of change is the denial part. Okay. So, let's start. Um, <laughs> My internet is unstable. It can be that certain clients can be on a different stage while you are applying an intervention that is of another stage. We understand what I'm trying to say. So yeah, it's very important to understand what stage your clients are in so that we can give them the right intervention. Which is motivational way of intervening. You know? Always remember that a person always has the right to decide not to change. Parindiyat sa option natin yan, ano? But when you go into MI, that becomes an option. Kasi it's the client that decides when, how, he is going to change. He's still here. <laughs> It's still here. Okay, hi friend. I don't know who your name is, but I hope you remember me. I call you sir. Helping people change involves increasing their awareness for the need to change. Oh. In the internet. Internet. So increasing their awareness for their need to change and helping them to start moving through the stages of change. So yung, yung ginagawa natin when we do MI actually is helping clients move through the stages of change. No? And we start where the client is. That's the kind of what I call as some sort of a diagnosis. Ano bang state of change siya? Yeah? Because a particular stage of change actually would tell us what kind of intervention we will be doing. No? Positive approaches are more effective than confrontation particularly in an outpatient setting. That's why um, motivational interviewing is part of training. So such as a new skill, when we try to train people with motivate, uh, matrix intensive outpatient the program. You heard about the outpatient program in drug rehab, right? So MI is very important because your clients are going home every day. You need to motivate them so that they will come back, right? That's why MI is a big part of the matrix intensive outpatient treatment program. So, of course, we also recognize that change is not just something uh, obviously ginagawa, but there is a natural process as well. No? In many problem areas, for example, people can change by themselves, right? We, perhaps we know some people na they have stopped 
well, probably me. I have stopped smoking without any intervention, but after three or four failures, so that's probably an example of a natural change process that I initiated of myself. No? So it is a process by which people change seems to be the same with or without treatment. That's why that's what the studies uh, showed, especially with the Puchaska and Clementi, who are the authors of the changes of change. And therefore, treatment can be thought of helping the clients go through the stages of change. Okay. The first stage is what we call the pre-contemplation stage. Look at the characteristics. One, they are unaware they have a problem, right? They're not too concerned about the drug use. And they ignore anyone else's belief that they are doing something harmful. So ito yung mga 80% ng mga patients natin that doesn't acknowledge that they have a problem. Okay? So how, how do you intervene in this particular situation? Iba, iba? That's where psychoeducation is one of the interventions in this particular stage. You don't tell them, you don't give them assignments, you don't give them any insight provoking activities, but rather just educate them about the harms of alcohol use and so on and so forth. Okay? That's the pre contemplation. Contemplation stage is people at this stage are already thinking of the possibility of having a problem okay and that even though they enjoy using drugs they start thinking about i enjoy using drugs but there seems to be some issues with my family or my wife right they are sometimes worried about the increasing difficulties the use is causing them so we are not awareness that's why we call them contemplators because there is some thoughts about the problem already okay and they are constantly debating within themselves whether or not they have a problem. The intervention again can be different in this particular aspect. So iba yung kalina, di ba? Total denial. A pre-contemplator, total denial. A contemplation, there are the, ito yung mga, yes do, I'll stop smoking starting next week. And then, it comes next week. Why did you not stop smoking? I'm going to, I decided I will try to stop again two weeks from now. And sometimes they would stop for a few days and then start again. Because they're thinking about it and sometimes when they're thinking about the negative aspects, they're convinced that they will change. They will start doing something, small, small things to change. But then I will go back to the old habit. Ayan. So the pro progress on. Okay. Stage three is preparation. Ito na yung merong acknowledgement that they have a problem. So they're deciding how they are going to change. So they recognize that they have a problem with alcohol, for example, and they're thinking what to do how to get help, for example. They can be ready to change their behavior and they're getting ready to make the change. It may take a long time to move to the next stage or action. Some people can stay in this particular stage for years. And I have one alcoholic patient, totally dito lang. So yung discussion lang namin for a long time is really how to go about sana to stop drinking. But he never stopped drinking until he died. So he got stuck. What intervention can you give? Well, you can start thinking about, talk, start talking about what are your options. Since you have started thinking about an option, you can go to an outpatient rehabilitation program. You can, or you may choose to go to an inpatient program. Or you may choose to, uh, to be assessed by an expert. And they will recommend what kind of program. Generally, in the Philippines, we have uh, community-based CBDRP, community-based rehabilitation program. We have outpatient programs, and we have inpatient programs as well, and a lot of other in-betweens. Okay. 
So yung third, ito yung exciting kasi they already decided to start and are raring to do whatever you want. Ito yung gusto natin sana ng lahat ng pasyente makarating dito. Kasi pag action states, whatever you tell them to do, they will do it. Ito yung pinaka-busy na stage. No? They have begun the process of changing. All they need is more skills perhaps, more reinforcement. So when you want, when you have your patients coming at this stage, lahat problema. Kahit sabihin mo na tumalon ka sa balon, heads first, after five minutes, you're still alive, you will, uh, you will not be a drug dependent anymore. They will, they will do that. I'm just exaggerating, of course. But, but in this particular stage, ito yung dream natin that patients will achieve so that they can start doing a lot of things no? para sa kanilang recovery. And of course, yung... Fifth stage is the maintenance. Ito na yung tapos na sila sa active stage. They just need certain interventions para ma-maintain yung kanilang sobriety, for example. Like attending regularly NA, AA meetings, if you're familiar with that. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, no? It's, it's, they can help in, in helping individuals actually maintain the change that they already have achieved, no? So, gano. No? So, let's work na tayo dito. Busy tayo dun sa active stage. No? Ayan. And then, of course, relapse. Relapse is not really considered as the number six stage. But really, somewhere along the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, relapse can happen. And I think it's important for us to understand that relapse is a common phenomenon in patients who are using their products. But also remember that relapse is not something new and that is not unique in patients who are using drugs. Relapse is common in diabetics. Relapse is common for hypertensives. Relapse is common for patients with bronchial asthma or not taking their medications, right? That's so why there was a movement a few years back, I think a decade ago, uh, using parallelism of those particular illnesses that I mentioned and drug abuse. Kaya lang the difference is that pag nag-relapse ka as a drug abuser, it's still stigmatizing. Grabe yung pagkukura ng tatay mo, nanay mo, at saka pamili mo, di ba? Pero si Lola mo na ilang beses na na emergency room dahil ng relapse niya sa uh, pag-inom ng hypertensive drugs, di mo naman minumura, di ba? So the point, during the time, was really to campaign for people to understand that addiction is a disease similar to other chronic illnesses that we have. Kaya kung mag-relapse siya, ba't ka magmumura? Si Lola mo nga. Ito eh. Once lang nag-relapse, si Lola mo every six months nag-relapse, may ER pa, may ICU pa, but hindi mo minumura. So that, that's the point. If you look at addiction as a chronic illness that relapses, you begin to understand them better, like you begin to, to interact with them more. No? So that, that's one thing that can lessen the stigma of drug abuse. And by the way, people who relapse, sa drug abuse and has undergone some form of treatment, actually the relapse is less severe as compared to the original use of drug nila. That's a good thing. Pero si Lola mo, talagang aakyat ulit yung 190 over the, yung 200 over 110, di ba? But with the drug use, to a certain degree, any person who has, who has been subjected to any form of treatment pag nag-relapse, kung isang kilo yung ginagamit niya bago siya na-rehab, nagiging kalahat din na lang yun. There seems to be a consistent treatment effect even if people relapse in drug use. Meron pa rin retention of the treatment effect. But it's something that we don't notice. Because we don't ask for it. And that's why we stigmatize our patients as well. Kasi nakikita lang natin yung relapse. Hindi natin nakikita na Iba pala yung relapse na ngayon kasi it used to be 1 kilo, ngayon half kilo na. That's an improvement. Diyan papasok yung another concept ng drug abuse treatment, harm reduction approach. Have you heard about that? Harm reduction simply means that some people may choose not to actually stop the drug but they can agree to reducing intake. 
And that is still considered a success. From 30 bottles of beer to 15. Or sometimes I have a patient that would drink three lapads a day and I can make him agree to two and a half. That's progress. Diba? And then progressively, nagiging two. And then eventually, one and a half. Yon. That's harm reduction approach. It's simple when you use alcohol as a as an example, but it's quite complicated when you talk about shabu and marijuana and opioids, right? <laughs> because there's a legal aspect to it. Pwede mo nasa, pwede sabihin, tatlong sachet ka lang muna. Ako na lang magbibigay sa iyo. But there are treatments, especially with injecting users of, of heroin in the US. They have what they call as harm reduction process, a harm reduction treatment. Yung ginagawa nila, Although the U.S. government will not sponsor that, because the standard of the U.S. government is that super, super, katalaga. The ones that are doing harm reduction are the NGOs. So I have volunteered for mga two weeks lang in one particular NGO. So what we do is actually the needle exchange program. Kung takasamen dito sa office, we will do clean needles. You can still shoot. But use clean needles. So in the exchange namin, pag naubos nila yung needles nila, all they have to do is go to the office. We will give them clean needles. What's the purpose? Kasi injecting drug users ang taas ng HIV rates at saka hepatitis infection sa US, di ba? So if you can't stop them from using, you might as well prevent them from contaminating others with HIV. So ganun. In certain areas in UK, I think, meron silang safe areas where the NGOs will provide you with clean heroin and then they will inject you. So parang merong, merong, ano, merong, merong konting window dyan to, 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 ano, uh, tawag dito, to ensure anonymity. So bagay mo lang yung arm mo dyan. <laughs> may pangalan ko, may chat ka. So, pag sinabing 5 milligrams per injection three times a day, ay hindi inject sa'yo. Until such time that we will probably taper, or perhaps we would say that, uh, I remember convincing one one patient, sabi ko, ano, uh, is it okay if we try to start you with an oral opioid? Methadone. Because eventually we will change the injection to methadone. He agreed. Of course, I, I wasn't there until he was done because he was dissipated for two weeks. But I was the one injecting him, and he was he started taking methadone. So needle exchange and methadone, yo, you're actually substituting the heroin with methadone, guys. Right? Similar sila, but safer. And mag maganda sa methadone is long acting. Pag ininom mo yan, this particular X milligrams, you only have to take it once or twice a day. Kasi mahaba, extended release siya. With heroin kasi, they need to take it at least three times a day. So when you shift them to another program, that lessens also the drug use. Aside from, of course, shifting them away from the dangers of HIV. Yun yung harm reduction approach. Okay? So yan. Exciting, no? Oo naman, sabi nila. <laughs> Pwede ka maghalat doon sa pagkain. So again, emphasizing the fact that someone who has relapsed is not a failure. And again, we, we tend to, uh, to say that relapse is part of the recovery process. And, and by the way, we look at relapse sometimes as opportunities. Opportunities to learn. Kasi nga, when somebody relapses, we do a relapse analysis. We sit with the client, what happened, what, what were the triggers, what were the reactions. So we learn from their experience, they learn from their own experience, and then they try to avoid the same triggers next time. So it's, it's a learning process. No? That's why it's part of the recoveries na meron. I remember one patient that I have with is Shabu Dependent. Napaka-perfect niya. 
walang relapse for 6 months or 8 months. Kasi nga, sa bahay lang siya pala. Hindi siya lumalabas. So sabi ko sa nanay niya, I'm worried. <laughs> sabi niya, why are you worried? Dapat happy ka doon, di ba? Hindi siya gumagamit. Sabi ko, I'm worried kasi if he starts going out again, I'm not sure if she's going to be able to say no. Lo and behold, one Sunday, went to SMCT, saw somebody there, and used again. That's, so sabi ko sa nanay, that's what I was concerned about. So sometimes we, we see, pag walang relapse ng pasyente, you begin to wonder kung this is going to last it. Mas maganda yung may konting relapse kasi there's are opportunities for learning. But that particular girl, babae siya. Grabe yung guilt feelings when she relapse. Grabe yung pag-process namin ng relapse niya. And after that, she might be used again. Now, she has a daughter and she's into an online business, a big online business in my part of the country. And when I, kanina, when I was flying in, when Ross and I were flying in Iloilo, Manila, kasama ko yung anak niya. That's why I get reminded, how's your mom? Is he doing fine? That's why na example ko siya ngayon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So again, ito yung stages of change. It's a spiral. There are relapses that happen, but it, it should not stop us from really helping our clients. Okay? Yun na. Ito na yung sinasabi ko kanina. Matching therapy goes to the stages of change. Good that you're taking pictures because these are very, this is very important. On pre-contemplation, pre they need empathy and of course, a little bit of education. On contemplation, we try to explore and amplify their ambivalence. Kasi nga, doon ang ambivalence. Change or no change? Go or no go, right? Okay lang. Huwag <laughs> ka tumatago. <laughs> Preparation, clarify plan and set goals. Pag-action, relapse prevention, maintenance, monitor and set new goals. Of course, relapse, reframe, drop back, and do a relapse analysis. Again, if we're talking about, uh, we're talking about diet, diabetic patient, for example, or hypertensive patient, the same. Bakit tumaas yung blood sugar mo? So, what happened? What was going on during the time? Diba? And we learned. Bakit uh, tumaas yung blood pressure mo? Anong reasons? Did you eat something salty? Did you miss your medication? And so on and so forth. Diba? These are opportunities. Again, relapses are opportunities for learning. And again, we're talking about behaviors na like drug abuse and other in this may not be applicable to our serious mental illnesses, no? Pag nag-psychotic yan, pag tinanong mo, bakit ka nag-relapse? Ano sasabihin sa'yo? Pag schizophrenia? Sabi ni Lord, eh. <laughs> <laughs> so, hindi po ito. Hindi po ito yung MI dyan. MI can be done with patients with schizophrenia when they are already non-psychotic and, uh, for example, you have problems with compliance with medications. Yeah, you can do that. But don't do that in the outside book. Okay, any questions? That's part one. <laughs> Nakahimahimay kasi yung slides. And share. Ay, start pala.
你回答吧。Mr. Agan later. <laughs> Mr. Agan later, okay. Recess. <laughs> Naka ano? Naka sharing ba? As participant. Sorry guys, try again later daw. Ha, ito ka mo po. Principles pa. Okay ka lang. Ako nga eh. Ako nga lumabas sa Zoom. I'll try. Ayan. Okay. Ah. You know, it's not separate because the slide deck. These are three slide decks, and usually the three slide decks are distributed over a three days to five days training. So it's not separate. And then there are exercises in between. So that's why. So let's move on to. Did we say that the stages of change is really more of being able to identify clients at what stage they are? And being able to intervene, intervene in that particular stage. Let's talk specifically about motivational intervention. Uh, according to Blaise Pascal, people are better persuaded by the reasons they themselves discover than those that come into the minds of others. It puts into uh, uh, it actually tells us that. When we do motivational interviewing, it's better that patients actually are able to generate the reasons for changing and what are the steps that they can do to make the change. It's not something that we will feed them. Remember, in motivational interviewing, the expert is the patient. Tayo, we're just knowledgeable about whatever we learn in school. But in terms of experiencing the ups and downs, the challenges, the difficulties, and even the consequences of their using the substance, the patients are the experts. They know what worked and what did not work. Okay, so that, that's putting it in the right perspective. So when we talk to them, we will talk to them empathically and with respect. So. Some people would define motivation as the probability that a person will enter into, continue, and adhere to a specific change strategy. So remember the three words, enter into, that's the first step, making a decision to change. Pangalawa, continue. So it's not a one-time thing. It's good if the patient decided that he will stop using, but that is not the end. The second step is you will commit to continue the change. And the third is, of course, over a long period of time, adhere to those interventions that is helping him change it for the better. So again, looking at change from a perspective of a continuum. Not because he decided today that alam ko yung consequences and I don't want that to happen again and therefore I want to stop. That is just step one. What is more challenging is the second and the third. How to make them continue the change and adhere to that specific intervention. Diba? Parang ano lang yan eh. It's so easy to promise something. Even if you don't mean it, right? But the reality is you don't get measured by your promises. You get measured by yung kung ginawa mo pa talaga daw hindi. And that is change. Of course, we acknowledge patients who would say that they want to change and we affirm them for that. But at the back of our mind, we also need to think about what's next. How do I help this person continue and eventually adhere to a treatment plan, for example. And therefore, we say that motivation is a multidimensional concept. It's key to a change process and it's dynamic and fluctuating. 
Lahat naman tayo, di ba? Sometimes we're motivated to do something today, but tomorrow, iba na naman. Right? So again, motivation actually fluctuates over time. And that's, we should understand that as part of the process. Sometimes we, if we see that in our clients, parang last Friday, he was really like ready to go, wanted to go into rehab. For example, one patient of mine, uh, alcoholic, and he's really, really bad when he's intoxicated because he destroys everything in the house and attacks everyone in the house. He was very impulsive, even if he's sober. So pumunta sa clinic, sama ng nanay, Sabi ko, no. uh, so we made an assessment and I said, um, maybe we should start with detox and meet muna tayo sa hospital. Aggressive siya. Gusto ko ngayon na. Gusto ko na. Punta na tayo ng hospital. <laughs> hindi, pa kayo, hindi pa tayo tapos. <laughs> tapos sabi ko, and then sabi na nai, what's next? Up? Detox, assessment, and then assessment will lead to recommendations for intervention, and then I said it can be inpatient rehab, it can be outpatient rehab, or just plain counseling with uh, some of the drug abuse counselors that I know. Then they said, gusto ko mag-rehab. Ngayon na, ngayon na. <laughs> so I have to de-escalate him because he was so what up and so hyper, and actually going some mild withdrawal symptoms, so I said, come down, let's do this step by step. Well, he is in rehab now. <laughs> and, he's, and my wife is enjoying it. Oh, he enjoys it with the structure. Ito, isang importante din na dapat natin kailangan i-remember. Motivation is influenced by our style. If we talk about motivational interviewing, the process of motivational interviewing is not dependent on the client. Although I said the client is the expert and the client is the resource, the outcome of the particular conversation isn't going to be the responsibility of the client, but it's going to be our responsibility. Okay? Motivation can be modified. The clinician's task is to elicit and enhance motivation. In so many ways, in the world, we'll be talking about maybe emphasizing how motivation is influenced by motivation style. When we do workshops for MI, one of the things that we teach our, our trainees we have to be sensitive to the clients, nonverbals and verbals. And when the conversation is going somewhere towards a bad direction, the, it's not going to be the client's fault, but it's going to be the clinician's fault. And I jokingly tell them that when you notice that, you remember Joey Albert. I'm sorry to Joey Albert, tell me where did I go wrong? <laughs> what did I do to change your mind? So when we do MI, dapat titingnan natin yung atmosphere but however the patient is reacting, it's a product of how we are reacting to the patient. And then we always make a self-reflection. What did I do that made the patient kind of anxious? What did I do that made the patient emphasize your denial? Yeah. Okay? Ay lahat, ako na, ako na. Parang ganun, ganun. Uh, again, just to emphasize, one of the biggest differences between MI concepts and other approaches that is in motivational interviewing, the person is the one who verbalizes the change, not us, the client. And there's a part there that would say, how do we elicit change talk on the client? Spell change talk. This C H E Y N E S. S T O K E. Not that one. <laughs> it's the chain stop breathing. Not that one. It's chain stop meaning C H A N G E and then P A L K. Just wanna make sure because when I talk to residents and doctors, means yung you pang diti diti by chain stop. Ayon. So one of the job of the Clinician is really how to elicit 
the client's verbalization of change stuff. Parang gusto mo siya magsabi na, of course, I think I need to do something about it. I think I have a problem. And say, my wife is important to me and therefore I need to do something about it. Those are examples of change stuff. Okay? So, motivation for change can be fostered by an accepting, empowering, and safe atmosphere. That's a big ask para sa atin, di ba? But we will talk about specific skills later on. We'll, we'll uh, skip this one. Another important thing that is so am I is believing that a person that is in front of us presenting a specific problem should be able to make the change if we wanted to. And then we support the self efficacy. Sometimes it's quite difficult to understand that because addict na addict. Diba? You cannot find anything positive about that person. Diba? How can I support self efficacy? Parang gusto kong sabihin na I, I believe that you can make the change if you want to. Parang yun yung self supporting self efficacy. Eh. Diba? Pero alam mo, this is the worst part of this addiction at this particular point in time. How do you say that? Mahirap, ano? And to think that you may not even say it, but your face is saying it. Diba? Hirap. I'll give you one trick that made me survive. Hindi naman na namamatay ka po. I always I always teach this basic belief sa, even with the psychiatric residents, uh, uh, even if we're not talking about their mind. The basic belief that man is good. No matter what that person did or has done, somewhere inside that chest of that particular person, there is something good. And it's our job to pry open those layers of defenses, for example, of ano pa dyan, to peel that off and to appreciate the real good person inside. And then you say, how can you say there's something good with somebody who killed 20 people? <laughs> May hirap, no? Kasi nga, we're prejudging them. But believing that every man is good simply means that people can do bad things. And these are behaviors. And this can be products of a lot of other things that's going on. Okay? But deep inside, meron talagang gold dyan na makikita. Sometimes it's difficult to look for it. Sometimes it's easy. But every time I get challenged by a particular client, I go back to the particular belief that man is good. There's a particular, this, this guy, is good. Wala pa naman akong makita talagang ng very bad eh. Kahit na you're talking about severely addicted persons, meron pa rin, I love my children, I'm guilty about my mom, I make him, him suffer, suffer. Yung mga ganun ba? Diba? There's concern there. Ewan ko lang kung picture perfect na antisocial personality disorder. <laughs> Ang hirap yata. Ang hirap hanapin, ano? Pero meron dyan, kahit konti lang. Yung lahat ng criteria sa anti-social personality disorder mo, di ba? Nandyan? <laughs> Difficult, no? But with that, I always go back to the psychodynamics of the anti-social personality disorder. Ano nga ba yung psychodynamics do? Behind that particular facade of a criminalistic individual, Merong, merong sa loob ang insecurities and a lot of bad things that happened to this person. Yeah, when we were born, we are all good. Unfortunately, some of us learned to do bad things over the years. Because of the environment, because of a lot of things that happens to us. No? Yeah. So, so basic lang na grounding principle. Kasi mahirap minsan if you're not grounded. 
uh, on the particular thing when you're talking to substance dependent people who have done a lot of things in their life na you can even imagine that you can do by yourself, di ba? But have you tried marijuana? Wala. Bakit? <laughs> marijuana is about to be decriminalized. <laughs> diba there's a oh, so, yung medical marijuana natapos na namin yun na, 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 na pag-usapan na yan ngayon there's another law that's coming up decriminalizing marijuana ang laki ng impact nun that means that any possession of any amount of marijuana you will not be legally liable okay for that PMA webinar, parang series yata. I'll be part of that webinar and be talking about all the other legalizing marijuana and be focusing on the psychosocial aspects. A few years ago, another bright congressman after to legalize na rin, di ba? You remember that? 16, 2017. But you are able to stop that with a the, the simple the, the, the reason was the sinasabi mo na treatment effects we're just beginning to research on that so we would rest on the scientific evidence that we see in that 80% or 70% of the time studies are showing that there are bad effects of marijuana versus the theoretical for the expected effects. Now the talk is starting to focus on cannabidiol and CBD and tetrahydrocannabinol. Diba? THC is the one that's giving us pleasure and the one that's addicting. CBD is, has the potential of therapeutic benefit. That's why we recommend that sa medical marijuana that we will recommend that we will allow it as long as it's in, in its pure pharmaceutical form. Hindi pwede yung leaves, hindi pwede yung seeds, hindi pwede yung roots, hindi pwede yung flowers, hindi pwede yung steam. A step para, the steam. Okay. So yung next challenge is going to be decriminalizing. <coughs> Looking at the data, actually Portugal did that. Decriminalizing not just marijuana, but a lot of drugs. Tapos meron referral to the healthcare system. Baba ayata yung rate ng cannabis use disorders nila. So we want to study that model. But uh, it's not just a single act kasi. If you want to decriminalize marijuana, for example, you should have prepared the healthcare system to receive people who are using marijuana and are suffering from a lot of bad complications, diba? It's not just a matter of decriminalizing it, but yung other systems will have to be in place. Your healthcare system mo, yung education system mo about marijuana, it has to be in place. That's why Portugal was able to do it. They invested in the healthcare system, including the police are referring to, referring patients now to set for assessment instead of catching them and putting them in prison. We call that alternatives to incarceration. So yeah, so we are we have a long way to go. So if you decide to use marijuana now, that is still illegal. I think that's Okay. So yeah, believing that the person is able to actually make the change to wants to. No? Okay. Ito na yung Karina, sinasabi natin. Lack of motivation is a challenge for the clinician's therapeutic skills. Not a fault for which to blame our clients. Okay. Again, you don't really have to think of anything. Titingnan mo lang yung conversation, how you're, how you're interacting with the client as well. Okay, so you might want to ask. Just like any other interventions or perhaps medications for that matter, MI has indications and contraindications as well. Differential indications for MI can be helpful for people who have motivation but very low, motivation for change. They're equally effective if not effective in patients who have anger issues and has high resistance. Yung mga angry mo na, that depends. 
I use that my anger in Risa. So it's doing well. Contraindications in which MI can be potentially harmful, just like any intervention, di lahat. Okay. Clients who are already motivated, already purchased. Ano ba yung EMI mo and motivated na nga? <laughs> Babalik po dun sa stage of ambivalence. Hindi, na, di ba? So, iba na yung usapan dyan. No? Um, prolonged evoking and high readiness of clients is unnecessary in the fair chain. So, pag-usapan natin yung evoking. Pag-evoke na yung, na-evoke mo na yung chains, Sa individual, wag mo na siyang EMI kasi ready na nga siya. So that's what I'm trying to say. Better to proceed more quickly to planning kung nag-evoke ka na. That simply means that talking about anong may no-op options, ano bang gagawin natin kasi gusto mo na mag-change. Okay? And respond to apparent incestual readiness. Ayan. So meron kong ta-indication. But take note of those two situations where MI can be very... That's why MI is highly effective in adolescents, generally. So there are brief, interven brief motivational interventions for adolescents using marijuana, adolescents who are drinking, who are starting to drink, and college students who are in the drinkers as well. So yeah, let's talk about the spirit of MI. Or yeah. Siguro, handa na yan yung ano. Yung laptop na okay. Kasi spirit na yung pinag-usapan natin. Ito yung underlying spirit ng MI. Apat lang siya. Partnership, acceptance, evocation, and compassion. We will talk about this now. Partnership is functioning as a partner or companion, collaborating with the client's own expertise. We I repeatedly mentioned that the expert in this particular dynamics is the client. No? And we are just trying to help the client make a decision on what kind of intervention he wants for himself. Pangalawa is acceptance and autonomy. You use the person's experience to teach rather than direct advising the person about their experience. So therefore, generally in MI, we don't give any advice. There are only except, a few exceptions there. So you don't give advice when you're using a mind. Okay? You honor the person's autonomy, meaning that he, he should be the one to decide when to change and what to change and how to change. Yeah. Communicating with absolute worth, accurate empathy, affirmation, and autonomy and support. So, Pag-usapan naman natin ng specifics. Evocation is eliciting or drawing out the client's own perspectives and motivation. So, hugot tayo ng hugot, the client keeps talking, you identify the statements that what we call as change talk, and then, it highlight mo yan. Parang isa, in the interview process, kung nag-uusap siya about the good things of alcohol, and then the bad things, siyempre i-highlight mo yung bad things. Para mo motivate siya, di ba? And one of the instruments that we use is uh, the pros and the cons. So sometimes, we make a table, ito yung what are the good things about the drinking. So right side, what are the not so good things about the drinking. So totoo ako niyan, because when I was training uh, the TRC chat, a staff of Iloilo, yung mga bago nila, one of, one of, the, one of the staff, was a recovering drug dependent. Siguro mga 30% ng staff ng TRC Iloilo are, are those who came from rehab itself. So they, they get hired as uh, part of the staff. And I, I remember this particular staff kasi he's one of my students in medicine in one of the med schools in Iloilo. But he didn't make made it because hanggang mag i na siya sana, mag i siya. But he was kind of bogged down with siya po. So medyo nag-ano na, nagkaroon na ng problema. So he had to stop. He only started about two or three months of clerkship and stop. Kasi disorganized, psychotic, stuff like that. So, but he, he never, he decided not to finish med school. He ended up with me and then eventually me recommending him for rehab. And he was trying to, he was laughing when I was teaching the stuff about the pros and cons. Kasi na-remember niya, yun yung ginawa ko sa kanya. 
sabi ko, ba't ba- ba- ka natatawa? Sabi niya doon kasi, I remember, ginawa mo yan sa akin. Yung, yung so we listed, sabi ko, what are the good things about using Shebo? What are the not so good things? Tapos nakakatuwa kasi, pag in namin, parang 15 yata yung good things about Shebo. <laughs> Tapos the not so good things dito is parang lima. <laughs> So, hindi ba conventional wisdom is pag marami yung ganyan, hindi, go on. Di ba? Maraming good things kaya, di ba? So, so, there's a technique. So, ginawa ko siya ng technique, sabi ko. Uh, okay, let's discuss this 15 further. Some of them are actually the same. Okay. Number one and number three, number five are kind of the same. So, swing. Tapos, <laughs> 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 Number six and number seven and number ten and fourteen can be described in two words. Shrink. Ayan. Diba? Eventually, then we expounded on the not so good things. I think five, parang naging sampu yata yun. <laughs> so we ended, we ended the discussion actually with five good things about Shabu and ten bad things about Shabu. And they, of course, with the collaboration of the client, of course. I did not dictate. <laughs> so, we summarize, we expand, parang gano'n. Ba? Eh, he's, he's intelligent, he's a medical student. Hindi mo mahuto yun. So it was really a long conversation. We spent one session just for that. So we made that final list. Sige, go back next week. So yeah, that was something that he was thinking about the whole week. The 10 not so good things, and then yung bad things about Shabu. And then uh, we ended up in rehab. And when I was demonstrating it to them, he was laughing so hard. I said, what's, what's your problem, Vince? Vince, yung pangalan. Sabi, yun yung ginawa mo sa akin, Duki. <laughs> exactly, that's what you did. Parang gano'n. Sabi ko, now you're going to do it. To do it to your yung mga patients na nasa rehab. So, that's evocation. <laughs> okay. And then compassion, of course. To act benevolently to promote the person's welfare. No? Being concerned with the person. So, ito yung sinasabi natin kanina in relation to acceptance and autonomy. Ito yun. So, these four are defined. If it's absolute worth means pricing the inherent value and potential of every human being. Napaka-universal naman yan, di ba? accepts and confirms the person's irrevocable right to self-determination and choice. Lalim, ano? Accurate empathy, the skill of perceiving and reflecting back on other person's meaning. We'll be talking about accurate empathy later on. Kasi yung usual natin is empathy, di ba? But accurate empathy is a different thing. It's much, much deeper than empathy. And accurate empathy means that nagets mo yung pasyente kung anong ibig niya sabihin and he approves that pareho kayo nang iniisip kung naiintindi. Affirmation, accent praise the positive, seeking and acknowledging a person's strengths and efforts. Sometimes you might say, paano ba i-affirm yung isang addict na ang dami nang ginawa? Masama, di ba? But you can always say, sometimes you just say, thank you, I know it's been hard on you, but thank you for coming nevertheless. I know that you don't want to be here, but at least you waited for 30 minutes outside and entered the session room. Simple as that. So empathy, acceptance, facilitate change, and reflective listening. Reflective listening is just really listening at the client and throwing back, speaking it back to him what he has said. There are three types, mirroring, simple and complex. We will talk about that later on. And of course, recognizing that ambivalence is normal. No? That is still part of showing empathy. Just like saying, feeling two ways about something. I want to change, but I don't want to change. And tell them that it's normal. It's part of the change process. So again, just to be very clear, especially for your other young doctors here. Empathy is not feeling sorry for someone because that you're talking about sympathy. I don't need your sympathy. <laughs> they don't need your sympathy. 
they need our empathy. Having had the same problem or experience, okay, and there's an issue sometimes in the drug abuse field in terms of for you not to be an effective therapist, you should have almost the same experience as your client. Sabi ko, now I'm going to have a problem. I haven't tasted anything shabu, for example. I did try marijuana when I was in high school and first year college, but I, I haven't really tasted shabu. Does that mean I'm not a good therapist? <laughs> <laughs> or if I'm talking about somebody who is like uh, using mushrooms, do I need to take mushrooms as well? <clears throat> you don't need to. <laughs> you don't need to. You mushrooms first. <clears throat> Progress to marijuana. <laughs> Identification with the person. So th those are not hindi siya empathy. Empathy is really the ability to accurately understand the person's meaning. Ibig sabihin na intindihan mo siya. And hindi lang ikaw. You project that, you echo it back to the client kung ano yung pagkaintindi mo sa kanya and dapat na-acknowledge na yun. It's a hit and miss actually. Sometimes, Communication is very difficult, di ba? Yung message, yung sender, yung receiver, and the one deciphering the message, a lot of go wrong, even in a therapeutic setting. But reflective empathy, or accurate empathy, means that you are reflecting what you have heard and checking with the patient and say, meron siyang sinasabi and then you reflect that. It seems like you're worried about your mom. What if it's wrong, sabi niya? Actually, I'm not. I'm more worried about my kids. So, but that's still therapeutic, right? So, you're reflecting it back, not imposing it, but you allow the person also to correct you. But most of the time, pag sinabi, you're worried about your mom, yes, and they're worried about her. That creates a um, scenario of accurate empathy. Ibig sabihin, naintindihan mo talaga siya. Kung anong gusto niya. Kasi, Ni-reflect mo at sa akin ng firm niya na tama ka. I don't worry if you make mistakes because they will just correct you naman. Actually, I'm more worried about my daughter. Parang gano'n. Okay? So, the ability to reflect, accurate, understanding back to the individual. Very important in expressing empathy is the attitude of acceptance. Accepting the person as he is. It's, it's quite easy when you're talking about therapeutic setting, di ba? Accepting ka lang. Huwag mo i-impose yung sarili mo. But it's quite difficult when you're talking about your family member. Eh? Kasi ang daming history na dyan. Ang daming yung good and bad things na nangyari. So it's quite difficult to accept them. Right? But then again, if you talk about patients, it's much, much easier to to do that compared to those who are related to us. No? And therefore, reflective listening is very important for the client to feel understood and cared about. Yun yung sinasabi ko rin ng example. No? Again, we avoid labeling. Yung denial ka, nagtigas kasi ng ulo mo, yun. Ulit-ulit ka na lang, parang sang simpo-sinto. Those are labels. No? Nag-inibig siya to be aware that it should be non-judgmental and should be collaborative. It should be based on the client and clinician partnership. It should be gently persuasive, more supportive than argumentative. Pag may argument na nangyayari, it's not the patient's fault again. It's the clinician's fault. <laughs> Joey Albert ka na naman. Okay. Listens rather than tells. A good motivational uh, talk it's really more of the client speaking rather than the rather than the clinician. And technically, uh, for us our coaches, we have a measure for that. Meron napaka OC na eh. Meron mga pero ng ratio yun eh. May, may kino compute kami that we will be supervising you for that. So we will compute kung ano yung ratio ng ng open-ended questions, closed-ended questions. Anong ratio ng simple reflections sa complex reflections? So, so yun. 
So it explores clients' perceptions without labeling or correcting them. Yun yung writing reflex natin. Okay? Again, the responsibility for change is left to the client. I have client that I have to see three times bago kami mag-move up the first step. So it was just a conversation, another conversation, and another conversation. Now, sometimes, another smoker na client that he finally decided, elderly female, doctor, smoke, chronic smoker, he just finally decided, I said, I'll, I'll stop seeing you because finally decided I'd rather, I'd rather die smoking than stopping smoking. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but acceptance, diba? That's what he wants. That's what she wanted. So she said, I'd rather die happy smoking rather than stopping smoking. Okay. One year later, she died of lung cancer. I attended the course. She was my consultant. <laughs> okay. This is the one that nagle lecture sa amin, yeah? traditional. Kanan, sigarilyo. Kaliwa, chok. Parang minsan yata, ginaganog niya yung chok. Kapit! <laughs> <laughs> Gamit! Tawa kami ng tawa. Sabi niya, anong tinatawa niya dyan? Ma, uh, ma'am, you're, you're actually smoking the chop. Ay, okay. <laughs> because during that time, there were no, not so, talking about smoking cessation. <laughs> there were not so, not so much laws against smoking in classrooms. Wala pa eh. During my time, wala pang ganyan. So the faculty can really smoke. Yung hindi lang pwede, yung students. <laughs> well, the faculty can smoke, and that 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 female consultant smokes for this uh, clinical correlation class. Sometimes he forgets that the chalk is in the right and starts smoking the chalk. You know? So focus on at least in the client's own concerns. Now, okay, let's skip this. Depending on our responses. Ito yung nangyayari. For example, if we view the clients as resourceful, meaning we invoke their own experience, for example, then they see that they are respected. When we view them as motivated, they feel empowered. So those are our view and how clients feel when we evoke or we try to make them feel about their strong points, their resilient, Sounds confident, capable, and resourceful. And Ali means just understood and wants to continue. Ayan. So there are four key processes in MI. Ito na yung kanina yung evoking. Processes means that parang ano yan, staircase. First step, second step, third step, fourth step. Apat yan. And you have to follow that process for you to be able to end up with the more productive session. So the first step is actually engaging. So parang at the beginning of the interaction, you should be able to engage the client already. Get his attention, be warm, make him comfortable, give him a sense that he can trust you and stuff like that. You're really establishing a relationship. If you have established a relationship, do a focusing. Clients usually come with not just a single problem, Marami yan, marami siyang sinasabi. Actually, the problem is using shabu. Pero pag nag-usap kayo, dami ng problema, may gambling pa pala, meron pa pala marijuana on the side, and then there's alcohol as well, there's smoking, and then gambling and sex addiction at shabu is a trio minsan. So sometimes you get confused, ano bang unahin mo dito? Siguro mas masaya pag sex muna. <laughs> But that's you as the therapist. <laughs> okay. So focusing really means that asking the question. I understand you told me several things that are bothering you. Can we can we talk about what is what are what is the most important for you for us to tackle right now? So you focus on that. And that, that's very important because I said because substance abuse and that problem, right? Little substance use, relationships problem with the law, 
kung madakit yan, marami. So really, focusing will help you target kung ano yung... Ano. Pangalawa is evoking. We're eliciting or drawing out the person's own perspectives and motivation. Ano ba yung... Ano ba yung uh, opinion mo regarding your views? So, siyempre, sasabihin nila. Pabalik rin na sa good things and bad things minsan. Okay? And then, of course, pag nag-agree na kayo that, for example, through evoking, you agree that meron na kayong focus, you start planning na. Okay, since we, you, you decided that we should focus on how you try how you would try to avoid using shabu again let's talk about more about what are we going to do after this session especially when you go home so planning na yun diba so okay we agreed that tapos i summarize mo pa yan we agreed that wag ka muna lumabas change your sim because your friends get to see you uh, ano ba yun yung facebook mo i Okay. Deactivate mo muna yung Facebook mo, yung mga ganun, for a week. So planning yun. And then follow up, and then so on and so forth. Ganun ka, ano eh, ito yung good and bad side of social media. Sometimes they start selling over Facebook and they just meet up in a mall and just swap money and, and sell book. So, engaging is the relational foundation. Yung ang sinasabi natin kay Nina, accurate empathy is important and it's a person-centered style. Focusing again is identifying target behavior. Okay, na-mention na natin yan. What is important for the, that particular person? And of course, important pa rin na hindi ko na-mention is what are the barriers? Meron ba barriers? I want to stop using Shabu but Meron palang kapatid na kasama sa bahay who is also using. So that's a barrier. So let's talk about what are we going to do with that barrier. Okay? Palakit ba natin yung kapatid mo? Or ikaw mo na yung ipatid sa... Yung mga ganun. Integrated things. Then evoking, drawing out the person's own ideas. I like this part kasi I always want them to tell me you did, you did, you did mention earlier that you stopped four times. What was the longest time that you were able to stop? Six months and one year. How do I evoke? What did you do? Ano bang ginawa mo that you were so successful in one year's time? Diba? That's evoking. So you are, he's actually providing the strategies na. Himahimayin mo lang. Punta ako ng simbahan, twice a day, <laughs> something. <laughs> yung ganun, I, I went to another relative, parang ganun. So isa-isa rin yun yung pag-usapan niyo. What work? Diba? Yun. That's one example that we can say that the best way of person is that hindi natin alam yan. What work for them, diba? We cannot teach them. Pero sila, sila, they knew. So, i-evoke natin yan and then encourage them. So, maybe we can try this. Inside. Okay? And uh, another thing, uh, in neuroscience, kaka, kakabasa ko lang kahapon yata, yung bias ng brain natin, why are we repeating our same mistakes? As, we, as humans, actually, we, we are predisposed to repeating the same mistakes that we do actually. It's quite the opposite. Sabi natin, pag nag-mistake, we learn. Actually, yung tendency natin is to repeat. Because there's a bias. Sa mindset natin, when we make mistakes, we feel guilty about it. And part of that process is to disregard it. So we're not we're not making any new templates about how to correct it. Pero, pag positive yung sinabi sa'yo at positive yung experience mo, you easily able to recall that and follow that same template. So sabi ko, this is good in telling you this. Kasi nga, when you are evoking previous behaviors that were successful, 
You will have to remind that individual, oh, you were successful in doing this. And then because it's positive, they're more likely to repeat it. To get the context. Eh, yung problema yung problema tayo yata. We don't, we don't correct our mistakes. That's a different story. <laughs> May cognitive bias tayo dyan. But, but that's the science. Sabi nila, people doesn't easily correct their mistakes. Uh, tends to repeat their mistakes actually because of that cognitive bias. Pero pag positive, it's easier to repeat the positive. Yeah, apply natin dun sa pasyente natin. Okay? And planning, of course, yun yun. Specific plans, anong gagawin natin for next week, for the next five days, anong gagawin mo, anong hindi ako pupunta muna ng mall, I will, yun na, I will turn off my Facebook account, change my SIM number, my, my cell phone, stuff like that. Very mundane things, but very important. Okay, any questions? <laughs> we still have time? Meron pa yung ano, yung comment? Hello. Dr. Ancheta has a question in the chat. Uh, in your experience, is it more challenging to do MI with a client who knows MI? Uh, example, doing MI with a counselor or someone trained in MI which is for a psychiatrist for them. <laughs> Yeah, like my wife. <laughs> Ako rin nag-train sa kanya. <laughs> Kaya, a bit. Because especially if, you know, you're playing around. <laughs> if he knows, if she or he knows MI, it's, it's a little bit challenging. Especially if that particular person is also resistant to the change. So she knows what you're doing. She's able to prepare a counteraction for that as well. Okay? That can be a difficult thing to do. But there are people, or psychiatrists as well, look, have done some MI work with them. They're okay naman. Siguro, it's also, um, uh, what's important is the degree of trust. Of course, they come to you for MI because or they just want to experience it. Most likely, they're having problems. And of course, you don't say, let's do MI. Wala naman silang pakialam kung anong ginagawa mo nito na, no? And usually, dahil na nakapokus kayo sa issues, yung process of MI, kahit alam nila, they won't really pay attention to that because that is a distraction. Say, for example, I'm a smoker. I'm teaching you MI, but I'm smoking. I need to stop smoking. I can approach any my my colleagues. But being concerned about my smoking, I would probably switch off my... Am I more? So again, it, it depends. But if your 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 client is uh, trying to test you or whatever, that probably is a difficult thing to do. And resistance in yon, di ba? Ginaganon mo yung conversation, gumaganon siya. That's resistance. That can be challenging, but not necessarily na you cannot do anything about it. I always say that somewhere along the way, and if there's a conversation going on, there are opportunities for change. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Um, um, who do you go to the Yeah. Like I said, it has a lot of applications. 
Pwede siya. It's fine. I'm trying to listen. <laughs> think out as much as I can, but apparently I did not think out a lot. So, <laughs> I believe you think out everything. <laughs> because I'm listening. <laughs> That's how you listen, as if you're interested, as if you understand. <laughs> It's not something that I, I do consciously, but perhaps because I've been doing these things like. Alamo na ito siya kasi. Kasi ayon. You see, if it's something that you practice, it becomes part of you. Because it's a conversation, like I said, it's a style. Of, basically, it ends up with style, a conversation style. It's it's not something different. It's not even different from cognitive behavioral therapy. MI is more of a process thing. Eh? It's it's not about ano yung cognitive distortions mo at yung nagawin natin, di ba? Si hindi ka interpersonal therapy. You have problems interacting with this particular person, so let's improve how you deal with your father. Yung mga ganun ba? It's not eh. It's it's just the Dynamics of two people talking and agreeing on something and hoping to end up in a specific place or a specific time. That's why a good MI feels like there's nothing going on but a conversation. So, I recommend the case to do it on the family first mm -hmm. and then afterwards, once there's uh, an available to the process. But I'm curious, what is yung MI mo dun sa pasyente? Uh, yung, uh, the patient that was uh, very anxious during the interview and you know, we the watcher or the gardener, uh, her daughter is, uh, she becomes, she's barely listening, but she just becomes saying, you know, about her office helping and feeling this way at the sleep. But whenever the daughter is there, she somehow listens to what they're saying. However, the, the daughter is putting a lot of Yes, yes. The, the daughter was labeling the patient, kissing the patient. So she's actually stigmatizing the, yes. so, uh, the parent. Parent, uh, yeah, uh, Yes, mm -hmm. the, it's the parent. She was 64 years old. She was. Number she, five, no, no, she's, <laughs> she is. No, sorry. Okay. She is 64 years old. Because next question, I'm not going to be the one. Yeah, you can do. Yeah, it's. She can do. Target, it's so important to say my target behavior. Eh? So, probably for the daughter, the target behavior will be how are you, how is she going to talk to her mom? Yes, so in a very constructive way. So, that's the focus of the MI. Yung sa mother naman, kasi it's more of anxiety and worries, baka hindi MI yung kailangan. Baka yung mga stress management techniques like deep breathing. Or you can do CBT for cognitive distortions, mga ganun. So, iba na naman. Remember, MI is only for specific behaviors that you want to change or not you, the, the client wants to change. So, very general. Kahit na ganun, na, it's not even a clinical entity, right? It's just a stigmatizing language. But of course, because it has a significant impact on your patient, then you have to talk to the doctor in a motivational way. But some other, iba yung intervention mo. It could be medication, it could be CBT for cognitive distortions. You know that. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? We have another question in the chat, but I, get, I think this is more addressed to us, IPBM. So, good afternoon, doctor. Thank you for a very enlightening um, lecture. Uh, is it is MI available in our IPBM services, considering the number of our clients? Uh, just a background. <laughs> we cater to 120 to 50 patients in a day. Um, but since it's a, it's a matter of communicating with our patient, we can always apply that to our patients. No, avoiding the listening, the, 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 the style, and assisting them, showing empathy. Those are basic skills that uh, we do to our patients. So, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. If you're practicing MI, actually, don't do that to all your patients. Yes. So, when we, when we 
do trainings, especially in settings like yours where you see a lot of patients, we sometimes encourage just identify one patient, for example, that you can practice in my skills, for example, make the patient come back every week and do that. No. The rest, parang treatment as usual. So, parang ganon. But it's a better way of practicing because you cannot do MI in all patients. There might be contraindications, uh, 100 plus yung napasente. Baka lima lang yung pwede na ganon. So, for you to practice, just choose a particular patient and then start to do it. Eventually, when you get too used to it, parang hindi mo alam lahat yata ng kinakausap mo. Parang MI na rin. So, the difficult part is really like, similar to learning. You become conscious of what you're doing, you try to run your mind through ano yung, na lecture, ano yung gagawin. At the same time, you're listening. Medyo mahirap yan. But if you continue on practicing it, it becomes second nature. So I was not even aware that I was doing that way when I was listening. <laughs> 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 Just an example. Yung very insightful yung nangyari sa there's a comment from the chief resident of Planet. Good afternoon, Dr. Dr. Javier from Planet. Thank you, Dr. Hamra, for a very informative lecture. Motivational interviewing is actually one of the modules included in our MPHC early for our okay. senior residents. In Planet Co, we usually do or utilize more the criteria principles for the patient person-centered approach. So we thank you all because we saw the similarities and differences between the two approaches. So, like I said, the roots of MI is really Rogeria. The only difference is that there's a specific direction that uh, that you would want the patient to achieve. In Rogerian therapy, parang minsan it's just talking and talking as if you're just floating in the middle of the ocean, not knowing where to go, or sometimes the wind will push you somewhere. So that's, that's the only difference. But uh, if you're used to the client-centered approach, that's a plus. Because you just have to add the direct strategic direction for the client. Yun lang. It's good, na part ng training nila. Actually, this is one of the point of this so that we can actually collaborate between two departments with regards to smoking CCE on the same lab. So we can plan more on what we can do. And I think the DOH already has a manual for that. Yes, and kasasama na yata dun is doing MI, I think. I think they mentioned already that in the, in the manual. I know that because um, a decade ago, I was involved in drafting the manual. But I'm not sure if you have updated it. Maybe we can hear more later. So yeah. Maybe they will let you have the updated smoking uh, system. So, Dr. Uh, Paolo Gonzalez also had a comment. Uh, thank you for Dr. Hembra. We are very fortunate to have you here in Davao. I'm fortunate to be in Davao. <laughs> <laughs> and the students, thank you and welcome. <laughs> What? I'll just be. I'll just be. Okay. I'll try that at home. <laughs> Dr. Lex Cabrera commented that the smoking cessation program is a two month while the DOH, uh, oh, World Health okay. Organization, and the PCCP. Oh, okay. So, you know, manual separate? Separate manuals. Of course, uh, if you're at the DOH hospital, the DOH is where I'm looking for <laughs> implementation of that. But it's it's a good collaborative uh, work. Because like, if there's a department of psychiatry in that particular hospital, it's really best to collaborate with them. Because there are behavioral interventions that can go in for It's a good training ground as well. Uh, you can learn soft skills from smoking cessation. Eh? You can practice your, your therapy and even your MI skills. Because they're not ka, ka severe in terms of alcohol and methamphetamine. Smoking is, you know, it's okay to relapse. <laughs> you know, not, not as bad as when you relapse on alcohol and shatu, uh, for example. 
Matayos si Chan yun din. Mas okay is to get people to go. So talking about nicotine being the most addicting substance in going to man. Yung 100% data yung addiction liability ng nicotine. And my problem is it doesn't make sense, right? If shabu is like 85% Addicting addiction liability and then marijuana is like 70. So why is nicotine legal and not marijuana in Cebu? 100% So we can probably reverse it. Make cigarettes illegal and start marijuana is legal and Cebu perhaps. And that happens. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hagan, and thank you all. So, if there are any other, there are other questions, we can direct to Dr. Rolita. So, with that, uh, we can have uh, Dr. Let's uh, Akaber. I will introduce him shortly.